It's time to improve the world generation in my Minecraft clone. This is what water looks like in my Minecraft clone at the moment. As you can see, it's pretty opaque because it's rendered just like the other blocks. Let's change that. This is what happens when we enable transparency. But there's a problem with this. As you can see, OpenGL doesn't like it when transparent things are in the same mesh as opaque things. The depth is messed up, and so you get strange artifacts like this. By separating the chunk into different meshes for opaque and transparent blocks, we can avoid this artifacting entirely. But now that we've got basic water rendering working, it's time to make it look better. I start off by applying a noise texture to the water, mapped to world space, and modifying the vertex shader so that there would be a wave effect. By using the noise texture as an input to the fragment shader, I managed to make a wave pattern up close. But when zooming out, it didn't quite look as good. It was then I realized I should use the Fresnel effect. The Fresnel effect means that if you're looking at a surface from the side, it will be more reflective than it would be looking directly at it. We can calculate the Fresnel factor by taking the normalized difference between the camera position and the world position, and by applying the dot product with a normal direction. Taking the Fresnel factor, we can use it to mix between two colors, looking down a transparent lighter blue, and looking at the side a deeper, more opaque blue. This improves how the water looks and doesn't require screen space reflection, which, although may look good, it is expensive to process. When I implement a proper skybox and lighting, I will revisit the water to give the illusion of reflecting the sky. But for now I am satisfied with how the water looks, so now it's time to work on infinite world generation. But before we talk about world generation, we need to talk about parallel threads. When you run a program, it starts off in a single thread, which means it uses one CPU core at a time. Modern CPUs have multiple cores, so we can take advantage of that with more threads. But you can't just tell the program to have more threads, you need to decide when and where yourself. Since if you do not take care as to how, the program will run into bugs known as race conditions. In my game, I have split off the program into three threads. The main thread, the world generation thread, and the mesh generation thread. World generation and mesh generation are ideal for threading because of two reasons. One, they take long to complete. And two, they do not need to finish a task in the same frame. When the program begins, the world generation thread is started up and told to generate chunks. When each chunk is finished generating, the is generated boolean flag is set to true, and the surrounding chunks are set to remesh. When adding a chunk to the world, which is memory shared with the main thread, it uses a synchronized keyword against the map of regions meaning that the main thread has to wait for a region to be added or removed fully before iterating through them while rendering. Meanwhile, the main thread looks at the list of generated chunks that it can see and passes them on to the mesh generation thread. The mesh generation thread holds a set of chunks to be meshed and synchronizes on this while adding or iterating through the set. A general rule of thumb is that if two threads access the same collection, you should synchronize on it. Otherwise, the iterator will mess up. When a chunk is done being meshed, it is added to a collection which the main thread tells OpenGL to send the mesh to the GPU. This multi-threading system works to allow the world to generate without harming the frame rate. However, we can improve on this using Java's executor service, which is a single pool of threads we can send multiple types of tasks to. This would mean that threads will not be idle as long as there is work to be done. For example, at the moment, if all visible meshes are finished, but the world is not done generating, the program ends with an idle thread for mesh generation that isn't allowed to work on generating the world. This is a refactor that I should take on in the future to optimize it further. The first step to implementing infinite world generation is to make sure that the chunks are generated as the player moves and unloads chunks far away. When unloading chunks, you must dispose of the mesh properly, or there will be a VRAM memory leak, and the program will eventually crash. Then I applied simplex noise on the terrain, setting water to generate below a given level. 2D noise wasn't satisfying enough, so much like Minecraft, I experimented with 3D noise, and eventually I went with that. After generating the 3D noise, making sure to store the highest block in each chunk column, I set the surface layers of grass and sand. Then I adjusted the noise function to have more density lower in the world, and less density high in the world, creating mountains and valleys in the process. By taking the minimum of two simplex noise functions, mountain ridges were created as a result. Next, I generated trees at 0, 0 of each chunk column, but I ran into a bug where the chunks next to a generated tree would be missing. This was because chunks are not generated in a particular order. Setting blocks in adjacent chunks caused it to think that they were already generated, so they were skipped entirely. This was a simple fix, and now I had trees decorating chunks. 
Finally, I set trees to generate using a 2D white noise, where a tree would be placed 1% of the time. That includes everything I've done so far, so now it's time to answer your comments. Why Java? Java used to be slow 20 years ago, but that's no longer the case. I'm quite familiar with Java, whereas I know for a fact I have much to learn in C++. So programming a large project in a language you aren't fluent in will lead to tech debt, and I don't fancy dealing with that a year or two from now. Another part of my motivation was seeing the vast difference between Bedrock and Minecraft Java Edition, and wanting to prove that at least similar performance can be achieved. Doesn't Minecraft already have optimizations? My video was targeted towards voxel game developers, who I often see run into performance issues very quickly, since rendering millions of blocks is no small task. I honestly didn't think it would get such a wide reception. Most of the optimizations from the last video are already implemented in Minecraft, but the Java edition has clear performance issues. These issues are not because Java is slow, nor because Mojang's devs are dumb or lazy. They are not. But rather due to tech debt that has accumulated over the years, they are actively trying to improve it, and I believe recently they rewrote the lighting engine, a huge performance bottleneck. Bedrock Edition was written from the ground up from scratch, originally for phones as the Pocket Edition, so no wonder it runs well. Java Edition's issues mostly derive from having too many draw calls and inefficient updates. You can check out mods that try to improve this, such as Sodium and Lithium. And as for people running servers, I'm sure you're already running PaperMC. Can you make this a mod? Check out the mods I mentioned before. They use the same concepts. My intention is to make a new game entirely, so I won't be modding Minecraft for now. Can you make this open source? It's too early to tell what I want to do with this project, but I really like Asperite's model. Asperite costs money, but the source is available, so if you can compile it, you can have it for free. Making it open source would help an active modding support scene, so I should strongly consider it in the future. In the meantime, if you want to sink your teeth into source code now, you can check out MindTest, which is an open source Minecraft clone. You should check out Vintage Story. I'll definitely look into it, but from what I can tell, it has a gorgeous soundtrack, so it has my approval there. You should add level of detail. Personally, I'm not a fan of level of detail, but it seems you guys are, so I guess that's something to look into the future after I'm satisfied with the block rendering logic. I've also tried octrees and run length encodings, but unfortunately it somehow wasn't as efficient as a byte array or layered chunks while being slower. That doesn't mean the algorithms are bad, it's likely that my implementations weren't optimized right. I can revisit it in the future if need be. And of course there are your suggestions, which are too many to count or display. While it's too early to decide what the true theme of the game is, your suggestions did help me narrow down a few things. The one block at a time philosophy has to go, and the end fight is unsatisfying. A lot of you want automation, the monsters need to be more of a challenge. Transportation needs more emphasis, and the inventory needs overhauling entirely. Some of you wanted realistic water physics, and to which I say, have mercy on your poor computer. In the next video, I'll be making VRAM optimizations and implementing a lighting system. So if you'd like to see that, stay tuned. Take care, and I'll see you next time.